Glenn and Gloria Sims really did not know how to take the good news. At first, they didn't believe it. It seemed too good to be true. They had been going to H&R Block to have their taxes prepared for a couple of years. Mainly it's because preparing their taxes had become increasingly difficult. So they were at H&R Block, and they entered into a contest, grand prize $1 million. And out of 17 million entries, Glenn and Gloria Sims were selected. When an H&R Block representative first called them to tell them that they had won, they didn't believe it. They thought it was a scam. Pretty much felt the same way when they received the first correspondence in the mail. It took multiple efforts from multiple representatives of H&R Block to convince them that they had actually won one million dollars. Or let me put it this way. It took multiple efforts to convince Glenn and Gloria Sims that the good news was true. That's a statement that leads us into our Bible study today because the Sims, I, I think they're not alone. Especially now when we turn to the Bible and turn to spiritual matters. It is so interesting to watch of how even among Christians in the church of how difficult we find it to believe good news. We talk about Jesus coming to earth and dying on the cross, offering a sacrifice for our sins. And so often I hear statements like, well, Johnny, you just, you just don't know what I did. Can God really forgive my sin? And the answer to that is, yes, He can. Do we really believe that God listens to and answers prayer? Do we really believe that the Bible, written thousands of years ago, can be relevant to our problems, our challenges, our temptations today? You see, church, maybe we're not so far off from where the Sims were. Maybe there are times that we too find it difficult to believe the good news. One of the things I love about the Bible is the transparency of Scripture. That in this process of teaching us the truth, we see real men and real women struggling to believe the good news that is presented to them. In fact, that's exactly what we're going to look at today. Uh, what I want us to do is to go through Luke chapter 1 and 2, or at least in, in some brevity go through those two chapters, what we're going to notice is that there was a lot of good news shared just in those two chapters as Luke begins his gospel account. There's a lot of good news. So we're going to ask each time, what was the good news? And then we're going to ask who received it. Then we'll ask, how did they respond to the good news? Like I said, maybe, maybe these people that we will meet in Scripture that lived thousands of years ago, maybe they aren't as much unlike us as we think. And it gives us opportunity to learn from them. All right, we're in Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. That's where we're going to begin our study. We're going to look at two real big stories, the story of the birth of John the Baptist and then the birth of Jesus. So we begin with John the Baptist in Luke 1, verse 13. But an angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of God. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's Luke 1, verses 13 through 17. Now, 
Here's what we know. Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were older and they had not been able to have children. So when Zechariah, by the way, Zechariah is a religious man. He was a priest. He receives this news while he is, if you will, on duty. But even this spiritual man, this religious man, he struggled to believe the good news that he received that day. So how did he respond? Well, he doubted. Let's look. Uh, Zechariah asked the angel in Luke 1.18, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. Well, again, there he's being honest. <laughs> so what did the angel do? By the way, the angel was Gabriel, very active in these first two chapters. Gabriel responded by saying that your mouth will be closed for the next nine months. And here's the quote, because you did not believe my words. I wonder what it would be like in, in the church today if we read something, a promise in Scripture, something that would be true to us, but when we doubt that, what would happen when we express our doubt, whether in thought or in words or in action, what if our mouths were closed because we didn't believe the news that had been shared through Scripture? I wonder how many of us would have been able to sing this morning. I'm being honest. I'm wondering whether I would be able to sing this morning. You see, I don't think that we're so far away from Zechariah that at times we hear the good news and how do we respond? We doubt. Well, what about his wife Elizabeth? Uh, let's pick that story up because Elizabeth knew she was blessed. Of chapter 1, verse 24, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. What a wonderful response when you look at that. She realized just how blessed she had been, even in her old age. By the way, their child, John the Baptist, was born. And he grew up into quite a man, quite a man of God. We could go to Luke chapter 3 and see that. And, and he truly did. He followed the words of Scripture that had been prophesied concerning John and his ministry. It's Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 that says, A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And that's exactly what John did. In fact, there are multiple references in the first three chapters of Luke that remind us of that, of John and his mission and how he was obedient to that mission. Meanwhile, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary received good news. Good news from the angel Gabriel. Now, let's look in uh, to see what was this good news who received it? Because it's not just Mary. It's also going to be Joseph, and there will be others as well. And then how did they respond? First of all, Mary receiving that news. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. But an angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you were to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So that's the good news. Mary received it. How did she respond? Well, initially, she asked the question that I think anybody in her situation would have asked. She asked, how will this be since I am a virgin? By the way, what was taking place was a fulfillment of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, 
and you will call him Emmanuel. Mary has received this good news. And as we see this coming about, it is already the fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture. You, you realize the news that Mary was receiving was news for which the, the Israelites, the, the Hebrew nation, had been waiting for generations. And now Mary received it. Now, how did Joseph respond? I want to look at that, and then we'll go back to the official response from Mary, if you will. Well, we've got to turn to the Gospel of Matthew to see this, because Joseph was skeptical. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, remember this. Joseph was engaged to Mary. The two were engaged. There's going to be the word husband is used in most of our translations, and the reason is it's because the, the Jews had a much higher idea of engagement than we do. And so that's why the terms are, are really almost used interchangeably here. But after Joseph had considered this, this idea of divorcing her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, for what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So that's what we see, that we see that Joseph's initial response was skeptical, and he's faithful to the law, and he sees what has transpired before him, and his whole idea is to divorce Mary quietly, and, and then just to move on. But an angel intervened to say, Joseph, you don't have to be afraid. Isn't it interesting of how many times throughout the story of these first two chapters of Luke and also including Matthew chapter 1, how many times the phrase, do not be afraid, is used? That's worth noting as well. I told you we would come back to Mary and the official response from her. She had asked a genuine question. How can this be since I'm a virgin? But what we see, if you will allow me to use that phrase, uh, an official response, it is a beautiful song. And in many of our Bibles, the heading before this passage is entitled Mary's Song. Over the years, it has been called the Magnificat. That gets its name from, it's a Latin word, and it gets that name from the first phrase of the song. My soul magnifies the Lord. My soul glorifies the Lord. That, Greek, that Latin term is magnificat. It's a beautiful, beautiful phrase. It's a beautiful song. Let's read that together. Luke chapter 1 verse 46, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down the rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Again, beautiful, beautiful picture here. Mary has received this good news from the angel. And her response is one of humility. Look what, the, look what the Lord has done for me. He's considered me for this, for this opportunity, this responsibility, this task. What an honor. She responds in humility and she responds with praise. So again, do you see the difference that we were seeing in people, whether it was Zachariah and Elizabeth to the birth of John the Baptist, whether it was Joseph and Mary, to the birth of Jesus. Now, we've still got a long way to go. 
there is a, a gap, if you will. If you go to uh, the latter part of Luke, you will notice Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. And after that, there is this gap, about a six-month gap, you would think, uh, from the time that she left Elizabeth until we get to chapter 2, verse 1, which is the time for Jesus to be born. And so we turn to chapter 2, verse 1, and we find out that Joseph, uh, among other men, had to return to their hometowns. Uh, the Romans had, had declared a census, and they did two things with that. It allowed them an opportunity to collect taxes, but it also gave them opportunity to make sure that the men who were eligible to serve in the military were signed up to do so. So Joseph and Mary made their way to Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. That's Luke chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. The time came for Jesus to be born. And you would think that people would be all excited to be going about town, if you will, with trumpets blaring, but that kind of announcing, that excitement of announcing the good news. The Messiah is born. The Messiah is born. You think people would go all around town and, and shout at But there were no trumpets playing when Jesus was born. You would think that the innkeeper would make the best room available because this is the Messiah that is being born. and He deserves the very best. But there was no room available in the inn. You would think that people in the town would respond by preparing meals and bringing meals out to Mary and Joseph and as they cared for their baby, but as far as we know, there were no meals prepared. We do that in our society today. But apparently that did not happen when Jesus was born. Uh, not even a makeshift shower. What we see in that situation is we see that Jesus came into the world in a most humble way. He came into the world in a humble way. Mary and Joseph, they found their place with the animals. And Jesus' first bed, first crib, was a manger. That sounds so good, doesn't it? Until you realize what a manger actually is. Jesus' first bed, among the hay and among the animals was a feeding trough. The Son of God, the Messiah, came into the world in a most humble way. Jesus was born. Life in Bethlehem went about as usual. We go down to chapter 2, verse 10. The shepherds, there were shepherds nearby, and they received a special message, a message of good news. Chapter 2, verse 10, they were told, what's that first phrase? We've heard it so often, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Let me ask you this. How did they respond? Well, <laughs> they hurried. They heard this good news, and they hurried off to see Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And there he was, lying in the manger. And they began to share stories with one another, and they were all just filled with such great joy after all of these things. I, I love this passage. We, we read the statement like this several times in the Gospel of Luke, in these first two chapters. Uh, the shepherds are rejoicing. They're, they're, they're just so amazed at what they've seen and what they've heard. But Mary, she treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. In other words, she soaked it all in. And she did not forget it. 
And she had a treasure chest full of these good things, didn't she? There is one story that we have not overlooked. I intentionally moved beyond, and we're going to go back to it now. Verses 13 and 14. Because we see this is after the the shepherds return. They're praising God. They're glorifying Him for the things that they had seen and heard. Now, let's go back to chapter 2, verse 13. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Wow. Heaven responded in praise to God and a message of peace. This heavenly host responded in praise to God and a message of peace. I love this. This is a quote from a wise man from years back. While the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns more than even for outward peace. What, what is he saying there? He, he's saying that, that people are longing for a peace. A, Paul would describe it this way, a peace that passes understanding. And what the angels declared in that message is peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. So that peace is not available to everyone. It's available to those that are faithful to the Lord, that have honored Jesus Christ as Lord, as Messiah, as Savior. So the good news, throughout Luke chapter 1 and 2, good news after good news after good news, it was shared and we watch and we see how different ones received it. We saw in the birth of John the Baptist that first of all, Zechariah doubted. And it was a very visible sign to everyone over the next nine months that he couldn't say a word. Elizabeth realized she was blessed, and she praised God. I'm pretty sure that Zechariah came along too as well. But I think the great story there and the, the lesson for us is that even spiritual, religious people will struggle at times. And indeed, he did. When we look at the birth story of Jesus, we see how, first of all, Joseph was skeptical to receive this news and to really figure out what to do with it. It took a message from the angel to tell him not to be afraid to take Mary home. Mary, humble. She was a humble servant who praised God. And as all of these things transpired around her, she just treasured these and she pondered them in her heart. I think about the, the, the people in the town of Bethlehem, whether it's the innkeeper, that even at a time that you look at this family and, and it's a special time for them, he didn't respond by offering or making a, a place for a room for them. They made their way just to be with the animals. What if the innkeeper had known that this really was the Messiah? Would it have changed things? And then for the townspeople, they went along business as usual, life as usual. It was a census, it was a busy time. And so they were going about. There were no huge announcements, no meals, no gifts. Only a visit from the shepherds. The shepherds who hurried to see and then returned to their tasks praising God for what they had seen and what they had heard. And then the heavenly host who praised God with a message of peace. Peace on earth to those on whom His favor rests. It is interesting to look. I'm about to share several quotations with you. And these are people that that did not believe in God. uh, Did not believe in Jesus. And what we will see is a consistent response of the lack of peace in their lives. Important point to make right after this. Why is there this lack of peace, this lack of joy in the world? That's the question we're hanging on to. H.G. Wells, 
He was about 61 years old when he said this. He said, I have no peace. All life is at the end of the tether. For all that he had done, there was something missing. And he knew it. And then we have, uh, this was a poet, uh, Byron is his name. He says, my days are in yellow leaf. The flowers and fruits of life, they're gone. The worm and the canker and the grief, they're mine. And they're mine alone. This is not a man filled with joy. This is not a man filled with peace. In fact, just the opposite. That he's seeing all of this, all of life just being sucked away from him. And then we have the poet, Henry David Thoreau, that to our knowledge was not a believer, was not a Christian. And in his conclusion of a lot of life was that most men live lives of quiet desperation. Most men live lives of quiet desperation. So tell me then, back to our question, why is it then that there are so many in our world today that have no joy and have no peace? Well, friends, it's because they have no Jesus. You see, the, the, the difference is, is that we have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, here's what that should mean. When we believe in Jesus, confess Him as Lord, and we repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, man, we should be filled with joy, with peace, because our sins are forgiven. We're striving to live lives of faith, of hope, of love, and to follow the truth of Scripture. Man, but we look at these people without God and there is an emptiness in their lives. They are filled with unhappiness. Look at the world around us. We see the whole thing collapsing before our very eyes. Look how empty people are, how unhappy they are. They're plagued with worry. They're filled with anger and they're burdened by guilt. We live in a world that needs good news. So I just, I just have two questions for us as we close. Is first of all, what has your response been to the good news of Jesus? That Jesus came to earth to live among us, to die for our sins, buried in the tomb, risen on that third day, and He's now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He offered a sacrifice for our sins so that our sins might be forgiven. Have you responded to that? Have you given your life to Jesus and are you living every day with Him as your Lord and Savior? If you need to be baptized, I hope that you'll reach out to us. We will help you any way we possibly can as you give your life to Jesus Christ. And we will help you, we'll work with you as you grow in Christ, as you mature in the faith. We'd look forward to that opportunity to help you. But it may be that some of us, you know what? It may be that some of us, this sounds an awful lot like us. It may, you, you may be looking at that going, Johnny, you just read the map of my life. Man, I, I feel empty and I'm unhappy and I, I'm worryful. I, I'm, I'm angry all the time and I, I'm just filled with guilt. Well, will you again hear the good news of Jesus? Will you hear that good news of Jesus and will you respond to it this time by coming back to the Lord? Again, if we can help you in any way, I hope that you'll reach out to us at Mall Road Church of Christ.